All right, here we go. We are live. All right. Hey, everybody. It's Melissa Dinwiddie from Living a Creative Life, and I'm here with Corey Huff from The Abundant Artist. And I hope you are all excited and ready to go. You're, <laughs> you're going to be really, really glad that you registered and that you're listening to this free discussion with Corey. We are going to talk about the five top really super critical important things that you need really to get <laughs> <laughs> really super critical important that you need to get started selling art online when you've got no resources except your art it's so, just me and my art you that's know, right what, what do i do <laughs> that if that's you you are in the right place uh, i'm going to be your host this afternoon so i can make sure that Corey tells you in specific detail what you need to do to successfully sell your art online. Uh, this is a really, really good time to grab a pen and some paper so you can take notes because Corey is going to be sharing a lot of very specific information about these five things that every artist needs and you don't want to miss any of it. There will be recordings. So you can go back and listen to the recording uh, assuming the te tech, tech gods are smiling. Right? So. Um, <laughs> So pay really close attention because any one of the tips that Corey's going to give you during this seminar could be the tip that helps you realize that artists can be wealthy, really, truly, truly. And the internet has created a, a truly unprecedented opportunity for making that happen for yourself, not just for you know other people out there, but for you. And even if this information is familiar to you, I invite you to come with a beginner's mind because staying open might just reveal that one new thing or it might allow you to hear something in a new way that could make a really big difference for you. Plus, at the very end of the discussion, uh, we're going to talk more about how you can get some free coaching or a website review. If you've been paying attention to our emails, you've already gotten gotten some info on that, but we'll talk about that too. So stay tuned, listen to the entire uh, webinar because you're not going to want to miss any of it. So let's get started with our interview, or I should probably say grilling, uh. because <laughs> that's what we're going to do. I'm going to grill Corey. So Corey, what exactly are you going to share with us on the call today? Good question. I'm a little punchy today, uh, <laughs> so uh, if I'm a little weird and a little bit of a space cadet, I'm I'm hoping that it'll just it'll just come across as charming. Um, <laughs> I, I I got up very early this morning to see a friend of mine that I haven't seen in about eight years. Uh, we went to breakfast early early this morning. He got into town for a business trip. And, uh, and I spent the whole morning acting like a high schooler because that's what happens when you see your old high school friends. So um, I'm a little weird today, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> You're always a little weird, Corey, but we love that yeah, about you. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, so over the course of today's call, I'm going to share with all of you uh, my experiences in working with hundreds of artists from all over the world, a little about my life as a performing artist, and how I learned about how to sell art online and how you, as the viewer and the artist, can overcome the starving artist mentality and live a life of abundance. Woo! So this process is going to be easy and simple to understand and we're going to have some fun and you're going to get my personal help in doing all of these things and I'm going to reveal how business people use the internet to sell stuff. You see, one of the main reasons business people make money and artists don't is not because art requires you to be poor but because business people have a different mindset. So I've spent some time with some of the real leaders in the internet marketing industry and I can tell you that these people, they're just as inspired and excited and fired up about what they do as any painter, sculptor, or artist. I'm not going to hold anything back. I'm going to give you specific details on what works and what doesn't work for painters, sculptors, and other visual artists. My goal is to help you change the way that you think about money and art, and I want you to take action, specific action. By the end of this webinar, you're going to have some specific clear tasks that if you act on, we're, you're going to see some tangible results, and then we're going to talk about those tomorrow in tomorrow's broadcast. Woohoo! Yeah. So, uh, Corey, given the um, 
the prevalence of so many you know slimy internet marketers out there, a lot of listeners might possibly be wondering, why are you revealing this information if it's so good? Yeah. You know, I always wonder about that term, slimy internet marketers. <laughs> I kind of wonder, like, who are these slimy internet marketers that we all talk about? I mean, there's probably some of them out there. The but, ones we uh, avoid. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I don't know very many slimy internet marketers. That's right, because um, we don't hang out with them. Yeah. So anyway, that's a great question. I, I have a, I spent a lot of time agonizing over money when I was younger. I grew up in a very poor family, and there were a lot of times when we didn't know how we were going to make our rent, and there were times when we lived in our car. And I've been an actor and a storyteller for a long time, and I know the struggle. I know that a, a lot of you that are listening today have been in this same situation, and this is my passion. And I know that if I can dispel the starving artist myth for just a few artists, then I can help. Um, I can help the art world and the and the, the the larger world as a whole. So even if you've had some success as an artist, odds are you know that your important and beautiful work could be reaching more people. You just don't know how to make that happen. And I want to help more artists find a way to do that. Yes, awesome. So. Um... You know, we're you and I are both always talking about this concept of dispelling the starving artist myth. Mm -hmm. uh, but for those on the call who might not have heard us talk about it before, can you explain what that means? Sure. Um, there's this idea among artists that in order to be a real artist, you have to be poor, and that suffering makes better art. Uh, and I think that's a total load of bullcrap. Bullcrap. Uh, <laughs> Picasso wasn't poor. Neither was Dolly, neither, was da neither is Damien Hirst. Um, there's a host of, of, of tons and tons of wealthy artists. And this idea of the starving artist is a cultural phenomenon that, you know, you can trace it back to a couple different places, but I like to talk about, there's this book called uh, uh, La Vida Bohème, which was written by uh, this guy in the 19th century uh, France. And he was living among the Bohemians, and he was a starving writer himself. And he wrote this f piece of fiction that was all about how great the Bohemians were and how noble all these starving artists were. And it was a work of fiction. And in the introduction, he said, you know, a lot of artists go through this kind of experience, but the artists that the great artists learn how to work past this, and if you don't, you either end up in the hospital or the morgue, or you become a professional artist. I mean, that was in the introduction, and then and then um, he the, his his book became a bestseller. So all of a sudden, all of the wealthy people in France were like, "Ooh, it's so cool to be a starving artist," and they started dressing like starving artists and hanging out in the Bohemian Quarter. Uh, to be seen and to be cool, and they're sort of slumming with their friends. To and and the book became a best-selling play, and which became a best-selling opera called La Bohème, which inspired the musical Rent. Um, so you can see that this this cultural idea has sort of sprung up, and we've lionized the idea of being a starving artist. When those who are professional artists, they sort of look at the idea, that idea and they roll their eyes because they know it's ridiculous. So there's hundreds of artists that you've never heard of who make a great living at their art and they support a family and they have, you know, maybe some work-life balance in, in, in some instances. And dispelling the starving artist mentality is all about helping artists realize that they can have the life that they dream of. They just need someone to give them the tools to do it. And I'm like talking with my hands. It's not enough for me <laughs> to sit here and tell you that you can have a different lifestyle. I have to take you by the hand and show you how it's done. So over the last... I don't know, four or five years, I have interviewed dozens of successful artists who all agree with me. The starving artist is a myth, and artists can make their life whatever they want it to be. And I really want to make this happen for you if you're listening today. I want to make a difference in your life. Yeah, and I have to say that I have also interviewed dozens of artists myself, specifically artists who are making a living from their creative thing. Mm -hmm. So they, they're out there. They're just not the ones who get all the press, like all the, the starving artists. <laughs> so Corey, the next thing I want to ask you before we go on is, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started? I know people are probably curious about how someone gets into this field, and I think mm -hmm. it will be really inspiring to those on the call. Sure. Sure, yeah. So I'll start with this. I am obsessed with the internet and technology. Um, I didn't have a computer growing up. I didn't have a computer in my home. I didn't have internet in my house as a child. I didn't have an email account until like 2001. 
And when I got my first email account and started playing with the internet, I had already been an actor and storyteller for like five, six years. And I'd done some commercials and short films, mostly stage and theater. And for the next few years, whenever I was not in a show, I was playing with the internet, learning how blogs and search engines work, how message boards work. Um, eventually, I started doing work for theaters and production companies. And we, uh, you remember MySpace? We started using MySpace, oh, yeah, MySpace. for, yeah, for guerrilla <laughs> marketing and to get, ta get people to come to our shows. So I still I wasn't making money from internet marketing at that time, but um, when I went and I got married uh, to my beautiful beautiful wife Lissy, who was also an actress and a, and, and a very creative person in her own right, um, I started thinking about okay, I'm making grown up decisions. How do I get serious and start making some money? And eventually, I, I went to this talk by this guy named Stephen Goldsmith, who we had on the Creative Insurgents podcast. And he spoke about this. Uh, he spoke about this idea of breaking down the silos of creativity, and it it totally changed my life. Um, so Stephen talked about how artistry and creativity are not limited to those who practice any of the traditional art disciplines, and that those who are artists can be creative in other ways beyond their original art medium. So it, it, probably the most important thing that I learned there was that there is no shame and being equally passionate about your art and anything else that makes you excited. So at that point I realized that I had to find a way to bring my love of art and technology together. And a short time later I took a job with an internet marketing company after I moved to Portland, Oregon. And while I started there, I, I started The Abundant Artist as a sort of a side project, as a blog to explore ideas of how creative people can make money. And artists began expressing interest in group coaching on internet courses, and The Abundant Artist grew into this extensive side project while I spent the next five or six years learning and working in the digital marketing world. And I left that world about a year ago to uh, do this, what I'm doing now, full time. And since I started The Abundant Artist, I've lived in a sort of this sort of hybrid life where I perform as an actor and I work in the technology world and I teach artists how to take advantage of online marketing. And it's really fun to see the sort of the tangible results that you and I working with these artists have, have been able to see. And what I'm doing is, is changing artists' lives and it's really, really exciting for me and I'm all in doing what I'm doing now, and I'm having a lot of fun doing it with you and with all the other people that we work with. Woohoo! Cool! Well, I think, um, I think the thing that's really important to note here is that you, Corey, are someone who has done this yourself. You are an artist, and you're also an internet marketer. So it is possible to combine those two things. So uh -huh. tell us exactly how you teach artists to eliminate the galleries and the agents and the middlemen by selling their work online. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The galleries and the middlemen are not the end-all, be-all. Um, yesterday, I had, like, seven phone calls. <laughs> I spent all day on the phone yesterday. And three of the phone calls that I had were with artists who had relationships with professional galleries that sell a lot of art and they were they all expressed their displeasure to me mm. their dissatisfaction and so it's it's one of the things that I love about the internet is that no matter what your esoteric specific interest is there are other people in the world who are interested in the same thing that you are and so as an artist that is that's really freeing right artists can create unique wonderful art that maybe that, that maybe they're afraid people won't connect with but then I can show artists how to get found by the people who are looking for the exact thing that they're making and so search engines and social media make it easy to find whatever you're looking for so all artists have to do is make sure their their work is visible in the right places at the right time in front of the right people mm, yes it, it seems like there are so many artists who are trying to sell their work to everyone and then they get really upset when people aren't interested in what they're offering. Yeah, exactly. When I was a, a younger actor, I used to take any performance gig that came my way, especially because I, you know, I want to be working and performing. And even if I hated the show or I hated the director, <laughs> I'd say, yeah, sure, I'll totally do it. And, and I see other artists falling into that trap. Taking on a commission or a new project that just isn't a good fit just to feed their family and you know sometimes you have to make sacrifices and do those things but it drains your energy and it sucks out your creativity and too many artists are trying to be all things to all people by focusing on doing what you do really well and getting found by the people who like what you do you can change your own mindset about selling your art and even what it what it means to make art yes absolutely 
but I think one of the problems is that most artists have no idea how to be found by the people who like their work. Right, which is why learning how the internet works is, is important. There are specific steps you can take to be found by the right buyers. It can, it can be overwhelming at first, I can totally admit that, but you don't have to become you know, the world's number one expert on, on marketing. I've had artists tell me that even just the act of learning about how to sell art online has given them the courage to believe that they don't they don't have to be a starving artist. Knowledge yes. is power. Yeah. Oh my god, so 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 true. So Corey, let's get down to brass tacks now. We know why we should listen to you. We know that why these tactics work and that's really awesome. But now let's let's get down to the nitty gritty. What are the exact parts of this that our listeners can take and use right now? Okay, so I'm going to give you just a quick overview, and then we'll go ahead and, and break each part down into detail. So the first, you need a place to sell your art online. You need a way to drive people to your art. And then you need the, the, the ways to drive people to your art are, are the following. You need email, blog posts, and social media sharing. So some of these things might seem really obvious, but just bear with me for a little bit. The best way to sell your art is through your own website so that you can control how the sale transaction goes down. You need to capture the information from all the wonderful people who visit your site who maybe don't buy anything right now, but who may want to buy something in the future. You need a place where bloggers and reporters and critics and other art enthusiasts can go to get information about you, and it should all be in one place that is owned by you so that you have your say in what info about you is out there. Um, that said, if you can't man manage to get a website up and running, this is where we get into the specific actions that you can take uh, to, to make something happen. If it all just seems totally overwhelming and you can't go through the whole process of getting a website up and running, there's no shame in getting started by selling your art on an existing marketplace like Etsy or, or ArtPal. So action step one for those of you who are listening, you can take out your pens or your lap, your keyboard and say, you need a place to sell your art. If you don't have one and, and you don't know where to start, then after this webinar is over, go to artpal.com and sign up and upload your art there. It should take you less than an hour. Yeah, and I think that's so, so great to just reiterate how important it is to take a step. Even if you have this big vision of having a fantastic website of your own someday, you don't have one now, it's a huge project, get your art up somewhere. Mm -hmm. to go up to artpal.com and just get it up. You need to have a place for people to see your art first, absolutely. Yeah, and I think, you know, we used to teach that you should absolutely have your own website uh, and, that sh and that should be what you do. And I think that's, I think that's still true, Melissa. Mm -hmm. um, what, I, what I think, just to be clear with the people that are listening, what we're aiming for is how can we help you have success online as soon as possible yes. so that you feel like you can do it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And getting your work up on ArtPal or, or Etsy or someplace is mm -hmm. a stepping stone, right? And mm -hmm. then ultimately, the you know later down the road, the big goal would be to have your own website mm -hmm. as well. Exactly. So the most effective way to dress, so, so you, if you have a place to show your art, whether it's your own website or something simple like artpal.com, the most effective way to drive people to view your art is to build a list of some sort. People that love you and your work, th these are your fans, and, and the, the easiest thing to do is to make it an email list. It could be a Facebook group or a forum or some other group, but it needs to be organized in a way that you can keep in contact with them regularly and you own the communication with those people. So think about this. How many times have you had someone come up to you and say, wow, I really love your work, but I can't buy your painting or go to your show or come to your exhibition right now, but I would love to in the future. Could you please let me know? And usually usually our reaction to that is, oh, awesome, you know, thank you so much. Uh, and, and what usually happens is we get their card or we like write down their number or we hand them our number on it, like a ripped off sheet of paper or something, and we promise to call or email them or let them know but then you lose the paper, you lose the card, you, you're not organized, and you never follow up with that person again. And you see them a year later, and they're like, oh, yeah, I, told, I remember talking to you. I was hoping to hear about one of your shows. Why didn't you let me know? And you feel like an idiot uh, and <laughs> feel bad, and then you drop into a shame spiral. Um, <laughs> but digital communication on the web allows you to follow up in an organized and automated way. And I think that's key, is an automated way 
of making this happen. So if you have a list, you should be contacting people on a regular basis. If you, if you don't have one, then you need to build a mailing list. And you can do this by blogging, using social media, building press contacts, and networking. So, so action step number two, if you, if you don't have uh, a list of some sort right now, you can go to MailChimp.com, M-A-I-L, MailChimp.com, uh, and sign up for a list uh, to start putting people on your list. And then the next thing would be to take all the people from your contacts, all the business cards and all your email contacts and all that kind of stuff, and all the people who are interested or potentially interested in your art, and upload those people to the, your MailChimp.com account. Um, and that might be five people, it might be a hundred people, but that small MailChimp account is free and that's something else that you can do tonight and getting that whole thing sh set up should take you probably one to two hours. Awesome. So the, yeah, um, the next thing that I would say is um, the, the, the next, so, so let's start talking about how we can get people on your mailing list and, and start being contacted by you on a regular basis. So the next step is blogging and a lot of artists say, oh, I have no idea what to blog about. I just, I just don't know. Um, but then I look at what they're doing in social media and like every artist is on Facebook, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and everybody's like, oh, you know, it's so easy on Facebook. I just post my art and, and, uh, and, and then I, you know, people like it and nothing happens. Right, you're like, yay! Somebody liked my art. And <laughs> meanwhile, I have no idea how I'm going to pay my rent. Uh, and and so a lot of you are are out there, and you're thinking, oh, you know, I'm on Facebook and Twitter, and I know it's a huge time suck, but I don't know what else to do. Um, the I would suggest to you that the things that you post on uh, social media, you could post those same things on a blog, and maybe expand your ideas a little bit. Uh, and you can say, hey, here's a piece of art that I created. Here's what I was thinking when I created it. Here's what I was thinking, uh, like here's how I feel about the process, and here's a couple of pictures of that work in progress. And then you might have an additional post on your blog that is about how you became an artist and what sort of things inspire you on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can do those sorts of things um, a couple times a week, a few times a month, and then you... T so there's a couple advantages to doing it that way. Um, if it lives on a blog, it's permanent, right? It's always there, and people can always find it, which is not the case on Facebook and Twitter. It's very difficult to find old social media posts. The, the other bonus is that if it lives on your blog, it can be found and indexed by search engines, which means that if people are searching for something related to what you do, there's a chance that you're going to come up in search engines, which doesn't happen if you're only sharing on social media. Yes, good point. Mm -hmm. So, um, let's talk a little bit about the process of how this this works. So, it's not a unique process. I didn't discover it and make it up in my brain. Uh, these are the same kind of things that companies like Best Buy and Zappos and Dell, huge companies, do. They they find these things valuable, and you should too. So. We previously shared on Art and Powers, you know, yesterday, Melissa, you talked about how you started sharing some of your new art on your Facebook page, right? Mm -hmm. And I know uh, about a year ago, we, we, talk, we did a video with Michael Whitlark where he went from selling nothing to profiting over $1,000 per month from his art in less than four months, right? So these are processes that are repeatable over and over again. Yes, exactly. So mm -hmm. let's get into these like all the nitty-gritty techniques of this in detail, what is the first step that artists can take to sell their work directly to fans? Right, so I think I should back up and say, and say that brings us to the last two things. Uh, remember this uh, conference is titled The Five Things That Every Artist Needs to Sell Art Online. Before we really get into the nitty-gritty, I want to talk about two other things, uh, creating great art and having a plan for your yes. marketing. Yes, 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 yes. Tell mm -hmm. us more about that, Corey. That's important. Yeah. So it seems it might seem really obvious to you, Melissa, that you've been doing this for a while. So the the first thing that you have to do is is you have to have great art. And I'm not saying that you need to be Picasso or Shakespeare or Calder, but you need to be making art that causes people to get excited. 
And I know you had this experience at, uh, at a, an event you went to where you had your art on, out on the table and people walked by and they were like, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. Um, but you also need to be creating art that makes you excited, which I think you can testify. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, tell, me, tell me a little bit about that experience of, of making art that you got excited about and what the experience was like of seeing how other people reacted to it. Can you tell yeah, us a well, little about that? It's so interesting because I built my, fir- my, my original art business around making art to satisfy client specifications and everything, mm-hmm. everything I, almost everything I did was to commission and uh, it was creative but it wasn't what my, like I was really, really you know, passionate and excited about and when I started making art just for me because I was passionate and excited about it I didn't know if anybody else would be interested, but I needed to do it for myself, right? And the mm-hmm. experience of having so... I had like, I don't know, 150 pieces or something spread out on a, a sheet, and people would walk by and, you know, talk to me about it, and, you know, that people were buying and, and telling me what the pieces meant to them and, and how excited they were about it. And there's nothing more inspiring and motivating as an artist than having that experience, you know? Mm-hmm. So we I absolutely... The, pe- people can tell when it's something that you are super passionate about. They, they, can, they can tell that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely true. So, um, you know, something that comes to mind is... Uh, in addition to having art that gets excited, that gets you excited, and by the way, I'm seeing there's a bunch of comments pouring in on the on, on artempowers.me slash live. Uh, there's there's comments that people are asking, and um, we're totally going to get to your comments and answer your questions. Um, we're going to talk just a little bit more, and then we're definitely going to address your questions. So the other thing that that is important in order to sell your art online is to have a plan. And when I work with artists, quite often the first thing they tell me is they've tried this and I've done that and I've advertised on every website on the web and I see one of the comments right now that says, you know, I have a blog and a Facebook page and a website and an email campaign and I have no idea how to make it all work together. Uh, and, And there's a lot more to building a successful art business besides internet marketing. You need to keep records, you need to work on your art every day and you need to be organized and how the heck, you know, how do you have to build a framework around all of this stuff? And... I would say, you know, probably the best thing that you can do for yourself is to sit down and write out a short plan that says, this is what I'm going to do and this is how I'm going to manage my time. Uh, And, you know, we talk about that a little bit inside the Art Empowers Me course. Uh, But I I think it's really important to sit down and and think ahead about what you're doing. And, you know, I'm going to just jump in here and say... This does not have to be an enormous amount of work to do mm-hmm. to do to to write a plan. Like we have this idea of business plan. It's like, oh my god! But can you talk a little bit about that, Corey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be this big deal. Uh, you you just have to be a little methodical. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You just have okay. to you just have to have a plan and have it write it down. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and the reason that writing it down is so helpful is because it gets it outside of your brain. And if you, like, have a list on the wall, like, a lot of people I know are big fans of checklists. Having a list where you can look down and say, what's the next thing I'm doing? Okay, great. It means you don't have to think about it. And it just means that you've you've thought about it in advance and you're going to start going down down that list. Um, So when we talk about creating a great website, you know, I I mentioned uh, earlier that getting everybody to go, just go to artpal.com and sign up there is the easiest thing that you can do. Um, by the way, ArtPal's not paying us to advertise them like this. I just, <laughs> I just know the guys at ArtPal, and I know that they do a good job of getting the art on the website in a way that is organized and easy to find and easily found um, on search engines. So, uh, you know, we used to talk a lot about uh, building your website in WordPress and trying to define terms like open source and templates and plugins. And what we found is that kind of stuff is really overwhelming for the beginning artist who doesn't have a website yet. Um, so I would encourage you to take a look at what is the easiest step that you can take. If you don't have a website yet, go sign up for a simple site on ArtPal or Etsy and then get your mailing list together and start contacting people that way. Um, 
that's that's what I would recommend for people who are just getting started. And then if you it, what what do you what is your opinion, Corey? Because I, I have thoughts about mm -hmm. this. But what is your opinion about um, you know you want to you want to have a blog or some you know some home right that's that's your own space that's not hosted on some you know external site like ArtPal or whatever even if your art is over there. Mm -hmm. So would you recommend people um, put their create a blog uh, just go up to WordPress.com and create a blog or get up a, a WordPress dot org open source blog which is probably a confusing thing for people. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so again it's all about taking the easiest next step right. Um, w one of the things that I found is that procrastination comes because people don't know how to do something yeah. or they're afraid that it's too big and too hard. Right. So if you don't have a website yet and you have no idea how to get one done uh, signing up for a simple site on ArtPal or Etsy is step one and then getting a blog together like we talked about is step two. You can sign up for a blog on WordPress.com and you can get a blog up and running in like 15 minutes. It's super, super easy. Um, they have a guy that walks you through the whole thing. You go click, sign up, type in your name and your email address and then you're basically there ready to start typing something ready to start putting out content. And then you can mess around with looks and design and all that kind of stuff, but it's actually ready to go in, in just a few minutes. Yeah, and then w at a point where you get to, uh, you're ready to move to your own website, um, mm -hmm. you can import all of that content from a mm -hmm. WordPress.com blog over onto a WordPress website later. Mm -hmm. So that's just something to keep in mind. Absolutely. Yeah. So so sort of wrapping all of this together, you know, if we were going to say, okay, to, on tomorrow's call, we are going to do some coaching and we are going to uh, review some websites for people. Um, what are a couple of specific steps that you could take tonight to get started and figure out what the next step is, right? Mm -hmm. um, just reviewing uh, step one, you need a place to sell your art, right? And we're sort of assuming, that, that's actually like step three, because we're sort of assuming that uh, you already have great art. And that's, the, that's, <laughs> right. that, that, that's the key, that's the key to success. Uh, and then we're giving you step two, which is make a plan. Um, so step three is go create a place for you to ha sell your art online. And then step four is put a blog together uh, so that you can have a place to share your message and share your what you do and, and your feelings and thoughts with the world. And then step, what is that, five? Um, <laughs> is put a mailing list together and put a, put a sign-up form on your blog or your website so that people can sign up to hear more from you and then you can email those people and let them know when you have new art available for sale and when you have new important things to say. Yeah, I actually want to ask you about that, Corey, because um, you know we, meant, we talked about this earlier. And can you explain this, like this whole building an email list thing? How how does this help people's businesses? I mean, you and I are pretty aware of this, so mm -hmm. sh share. Share. <laughs> um, yeah, great question. So, building a mailing list. It, you know, I talked about this a little bit earlier. That sometimes you run into people and they say, "Oh, yeah, I, I really like what you do, but I, I can't buy it from you right now, or I can't go to your event right now." Um, Catching people's information and following up with them, uh, it, the mailing list is key to that. So basically what happens is once you have a mailing list in place, you have a way to send one email that goes out to all of those people. So if you meet somebody and they say, yes, I really like what you do, you drop them into your mailing list, and then uh, next time you have an important update, you, you go into your... Mailchimp.com account or whatever email program you use, and you uh, type type up your email and hit send, and it sends it out to all of those people um, at one time. So that vastly simplifies the act of promoting your work and and gives you the ability to communicate with people on a regular basis. So what about uh, the people out there who might be thinking, oh my god, I don't want my customers to think that I'm spamming them. Mm -hmm. Well, don't spam them. You know, that's the simple, <laughs> that's the simple answer. Uh, a lot of times people think that if I'm promoting my stuff, 
then I'm spamming people. But the truth is, if somebody says, hey, I want to hear from you, I want to hear about your work, and I want to hear about your uh, events, then that's them signing up and saying, let me know. Right? Exactly. So you be respectful of their time and let them know about what you're doing, um, but do let them know. You know, don't be shy. Otherwise, your business won't grow. Yeah, exactly. And that's why people sign up to be on your list because they want to get notifications from you. They want to hear mm -hmm. from you. Yeah. What about the artists, though, Corey, who are thinking, I'm not a writer? That's okay. It doesn't have to be, <laughs> it doesn't have to be, you know, of course you're not a writer. You're a visual artist. You communicate through paint and sculpture and whatever else your medium is. And that's okay. You don't have to be a great writer. You just have to make it personal. Um, one of the challenges that, uh, that a lot of people have with trying to buy art and look at art and evaluate art is understanding what the art is about. There's this, we've built up this mystique around art that says that it's really important and that it says things that the average person can't understand. And really the only difference is that you and I think about art all the time, we look at art all the time, we talk about the history of art. Most people don't have that background. So if you can just give them a little, a little taste, a little bit of understanding of the background of the art, your background, what you're thinking about, what you're feeling, that gives people a little, like a little handhold or a little way to view inside and get a little understanding of, of what that art is and why they should care about it. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, people love, love, love the creative process, are fascinated by the creative process. Sharing mm -hmm. your process is a great way to get people interested. The other thing that I, I want to I wanna touch on here, Corey, is a lot of, I know a lot of artists get sort of freaked out when they send out an email and, oh my goodness, only 30% of the people opened the email or 25% or 40% or whatever. Oh, this is a terrible email. Oh, I'm, I'm failing. Mm -hmm. Share about the reality there. So the reality is that most people's mailing lists, the, the open rates are usually less than 30%. You know, probably 90, 95% of people, their mailing list open rate is less than 30%. Uh, the truth is, you send an email out to a bunch of people, not all of them are going to have time to read it. You probably don't read every email that you get. <laughs> everybody, else is, everybody else is the same way. We're all busy. Um, and so that's why regular communication is important. Just because somebody doesn't answer one, doesn't open one of your emails, doesn't mean they won't open another one of your emails later on. Exactly. And if you think about mm -hmm. it, like even if you had say 15% of your the people who were interested in your work that were looking at your stuff every week, that could totally change your business, and you could end up selling a lot more. Mhm. Mm yeah. So I I would really love to open it up to comments to those that are watching live. Um, yes, let's do so, it. Yeah, so just to reiterate, you know, those of you that are listening now, um, we are going to be sending out an email to those on the Art Empowers Me waiting list uh, with, uh, with an opportunity to submit your website, to have us review your website, or to have a mini coaching session where we can address a specific challenge that you're having in your art business. Um, so if you're watching this and you're on the Art Empowers Me mailing list, you'll get that email later today. If you're not watching it, or if you're not on the mailing list rather, go to artempowers.me and sign up for our mailing list and you'll get that email later tonight um, letting you know how you can sign up for a website review or a coaching session uh, for tomorrow's call. And we'll, we're actually going to review people's websites live. We'll do a screen share so everybody can see what we're talking about as we go through and, and critique people's websites point by point. These have traditionally been very, very popular sessions. Um, and, and sometimes we could go hours and hours going through, people's, <laughs> going through people's websites. And people find it fascinating. We find it really fun. Um, so we're really excited to do that for those of you who are part of the Art Empowers community. Um, so those specific actions that we want you to take uh, today are, you know, make sure that you have a place to sell your art, go sign up for a blog, and go sign up for a mailing list like MailChimp, and get those things up and running. You can do those things tonight. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So let's look at these questions. We got a lot of them pouring in here. Uh, mm -hmm. So Adrian asks first, how much I think he's here. How much should you ask for when selling an illustration? And 
how and what do you put down when selling work off of magazines and agents? I'm not uh, I'm not understanding the second part of that question. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> pricing illustration, where when when I'm dealing with design or illustration work, I consult my and I'm looking um, on my bookshelf. The Graphic Artist Guild's Pricing and Ethical Guidelines there is the go. first place that I would go, um, and yeah, that's where that's a great starting place. The the Graphic Artist Guild. Uh, Pricing and ethical guidelines. That's where I'd start. Okay. There's, yeah, a whole bunch of comments coming in. So, uh, let's see. Bridget says, what's the most effective, least obnoxious way to integrate blog plus sales site plus Facebook personal plus Facebook business page? Great question. Um, so, Bridget, this is exactly... Uh, what we're talking about when we say not having a plan in place. Um, you've got sort of a lot of different things going on. Um, so good job getting your blog up and getting your sales site up and having your Facebook business page up. Um, one thing I would say is you can probably drop the Facebook personal page. You don't need to use that when you're marketing. Uh, in fact, Facebook says that you shouldn't use personal pages for marketing. Uh, so in the context of working on your art business, you can drop that from the mix. Um, so the thing that I would say is make your website the center of your universe. The ideal integration would is, is that your sales site and your blog are the same website. So it's like, you know, Bridget.com and that's your sales site and you have all your art for sale there. And then maybe Bridget.com slash blog is your blog page and they're all on the same domain. Um, so getting people to the blog through uh, all of that activity also gives them puts them on the same website where they can they can see your art. That's the best kind of integration. And then pushing stuff from your blog and stuff from your shop uh, out to your Facebook business page is the way to think about that. So you think about your website and blog as the center of your world, and then Facebook and your email and all that other stuff is sort of spokes and and rims outside of your this outside of your center. Um, and, and all of those things go out from the center and help feed each other um, and sending people back to your website. Is that clear? The, the only thing that I would contradict or say differently there is that I have found my Facebook personal page to be quite helpful because often it's people who know me already who buy my work. So mm -hmm. the way that, and I don't, I, when I don't approach um, my Facebook personal page as um, marketing the way we would you know, often think about marketing, but I share my art process both there and on my business page. And that is, that's the kind of marketing that is the most useful. It's not, it doesn't feel like marketing. It doesn't seem like marketing. I'm just sharing my, my art process and sharing my art. And I get a lot of, you know, interaction with people and sometimes I make sales that way. Yep. Yep. Holly says, are there specific places to network and meet interested persons other than the internet or art fairs or galleries? Hmm. I have an answer to that. Or I, I have <laughs> okay. an opinion right. about that. Go um, ahead. It, basically, everywhere is a potential place to network and meet interested people. So uh, one thing, one very important um, marketing that doesn't feel so much like marketing thing that I that I think is a great thing to do is have some business cards made up. Go to um, moo.com, M-O-O.com, uh -huh. and yep. have business cards made up with your art on the back and all of your contact info on the other side. And everywhere you go, you can you know, strike up a conversation with somebody and if they're interested in your art, you can hand them a little tiny piece of your art and that becomes a conversation piece and, and you can spread them out like a, you know, deck of cards and people can choose the one that they like best. Um, and just start to pay attention of the kinds of people who like your art and who respond to your art and where those people hang out. And it may surprise you. I mean, maybe maybe the people who like your art all are really, you know, many of them are into soccer. I mean, who knows, mm -hmm. right? So if that's the case, then you might want to go hang out with soccer playing groups <laughs> or whatever. Yep. You know, I mean, that's sort of a random, random example. But um, keep your eyes open and... This is a place where we as artists get to think really creatively and have fun with our marketing that doesn't feel like marketing. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add to that, Corey? No.
No, I think that's great. Uh, you know, I love, uh, I'm a big fan of Moo.com just because it's called Moo.com. Uh, but <laughs> but I, I love the idea of being able to lay a stack of cards on the table and each one is a different piece of art. It's a miniature version of your art. Um, making yourself as ubiquitous as possible and giving people something to, to grasp and hold and talk about uh, works really well for artists. Um, you know, the original question that Holly asked is, are there places to network and meet people other than the internet or art fairs or galleries? You know, that covers a lot of ground. Um, and my concern with that question is if you're thinking that you've tried those things and they don't work, um, I, w I would suggest to you, Holly, that it might be that you, you need a little instruction or help on figuring out how to make those things work because that covers a lot of ground, the internet, art fairs, and galleries. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Other questions that people have. Refreshing my page here. Okay, so Bridget says uh, she uses a spreadsheet to keep track of her daily activities. That's awesome, Bridget. Cool. Um, yeah, that's definitely what you should be doing. Um, okay, Joanne says, my question is about email lists. The list I currently have consists of mostly friends and acquaintances from church. Others are folks who have expressed an interest in classes I used to offer. These names are two to three years old. Um, should okay, so my list is getting old and aging out, and it, it might be a little bit irrelevant. Should I use it or purge it or something else? Melissa, do you have any thoughts? Yes, I do. Um, I actually just recently did a pretty major purge of my email list because I had I use a Weber for my person my my mailing list provider and the way that it works is it's a bazillion different, you create a different, a new list for each, you know, course or whatever I want to email people about. Mm -hmm. And some of those were getting really, really old and uh, I, I, my open rates I knew could be better. So I want I want people who are on my list to be there because they really want to hear from me. Mm -hmm. So I emailed my, those specific lists that were getting old and I said, Hey, something something to the equivalent of Hey, it's been a um, a while since you've been opening my email. Aweber lets me see if how if they've opened my email in six months or whatever. So it's been six months since you've opened my email, or it's been a while since I've contacted you. Would be perhaps in your case, Joanne. Um, here's what I've got going on right now. If you are uh, you know interested, you you could either have an opt in. So mm -hmm. if you're interested, click here to get on my new list. Um, you'll probably have very few opt-ins if you do that, but they will be very interested. Um, or you can say, I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to be emailing you again, and I invite you to opt out if you don't want to hear me hear from me anymore, and click this link you know, at the bottom or whatever to, to not be on my list anymore, to get off my list. So right. I really believe in being very upfront with people about, hey, I'm going to be emailing you, if you don't want to be on my list, here's how you get off of it. I don't want I don't want to have people on my list who don't want to be there, right? Uh -huh. So that's how I would handle that. Um, what about what, what about you, Corey? Yeah, I I that's exactly it. Uh, I just did a big purge uh, of my mailing list. Um, you know, my mailing I, it was I was a bad marketer and I let that list go for about four years before I did any purges, and um, it was amazing to see like. I just took everybody who hadn't opened any of my mails in the last six months and I sent them all an email and said, you know, hey, I uh, haven't heard from you for a while. Uh, I'm going to remove you from the list. Let me know if you don't want me to. And I got a handful of people that said, you know, don't, don't remove me. I really enjoy your stuff. Um, I just don't read it all the time. And then uh, I, the rest of them I just never heard from and I got rid of them. And it's, it's interesting, uh, like, from a technical marketing standpoint, the removing people who don't open your emails is actually really good for you uh, because it, it having a low open rate uh, actually hurts you in deliverability. Mm -hmm. uh, so once your list gets above a certain size, if only like you know 10, 15 percent of your list is opening your emails, then uh, more of the the email providers like Gmail and Yahoo and stuff um, will start sending your emails to spam. Mm -hmm. So purging your old list is is really a good idea. 
yeah, so it's quality of your list that's more important than the quantity of people on it and it can be really, really anxiety provoking when you're starting out that you, you know, oh my god, I only have five people or I only have, you know, 75 people or whatever on my list and it feels like, ah, it's so tiny, but believe me, you really want people who want to be on your list. You don't want a huge list of people who, you know, if you have 2,000 people on your list and none of them open your emails, that is not going to make you happy. <laughs> yeah. I know I know an artist who has about 500 people on her mailing list and she makes a full-time living from that. Yes. It is yeah. possible if you've got people who are really true fans and really really interested in buying and collecting your stuff, you don't need a million of them in right. order to make a living. Yeah. Yeah. So Nicole, and I can't, I'm pretty sure I'm going to just butcher uh, Nicole's last name. I'm going to say Ick Turts, and I'm sure that's terrible. Uh, <laughs> so Nicole says, what is a good online site to get color illustrations printed into cards? Melissa, you've done stuff like this, haven't you? Um, I've done, oh gosh, I, I've done so many different things. I used to print all of my stuff in-house mm -hmm. on my own. I've also print, worked with local printers a lot. Um, I have not. Uh, I, I've actually been looking around myself to get to for a, an online site. I think Moo.com mm -hmm. does um, greeting cards, and I've received some greeting cards from people who've used Moo, and I thought they were quite nice. I don't know how expensive they were, but mm -hmm. they were quite nice, and I don't know how quick the turnaround is. Um, there are a lot. The, a lot of the companies that make business cards also make greeting cards. So mm -hmm. I would do a search on that. Um, if it sounds like you want to have like cards in stock to be able to sell, uh, I also sell some work on. I have a Zazzle shop. Um, there's another one, ugh, and I'm spacing on the name of it. There's a, a bunch of these uh, companies that do print on demand. So Fine you can, Art America. Fine Art America does it, mm -hmm. and then there's another yep. one that I'm spacing on the name of right now, but. You upload a high resolution file of whatever art you want, and then you can specify, oh, I want this to be a poster, I want this to be, um, you know, buttons, I want it to be an apron, I want it to be greeting cards, whatever. And then you can have this little shop there, and you don't have to do anything. You can, and you can set the percentage that you want to make. Mm -hmm. And I think the default is like 10%. So if you, if you charge a dollar, then you're going to get 10 cents from, from the sale. Um, but you can play with the percentage that you want to make, so you can, you know, make make more off of each sale and the, make the thing more expensive. Uh, so that's that's kind of a nice little. It's not going to probably generate a ton of income, but it's a nice mm -hmm. way to be able to offer things when you don't want to have to deal with printing them yourself, having them in stock somewhere, shipping all of that stuff. Because Zazzle or Fine Art America or wherever they they take care of all that for you. So hopefully that gives you some. Some things to go on, Nicole. Great. Ooh, and Micah, Micah, I'm not sure how you pronounce your name. Pricing. Woo, woo, woo. We could talk for hours on pricing alone. Yay, pricing. <laughs> so um, Micah says, how do I know it's correct? I mm -hmm. hear my buyers tell me it's so reasonable, yet I go without <laughs> sales at many art fairs. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So I have to say, like, the first thing that springs to mind with that is uh, often our, our sort of uh, gut reaction if something's not selling is to lower the price because we think that, oh, if I lower the price, then maybe people will actually buy it. But it may not be uh, that the price being too low or too high, that may not be an issue for people who are looking at your work. And there's a perception issue happening. So when people see a low price then they think, oh, this isn't worth very much. It's not very valuable. When it, If they see the same thing with a higher price, they will think, oh, it's a more valuable thing. So I have, I have had, I can't tell you how many times this has happened, where I've had a piece that wasn't selling and I raised the price and then it sold. So, yep. um, as, so that's one little piece. As far as knowing when it's correct, there really is no correct. Um, but, and pricing is an ongoing, ongoing trial and error thing. What The things that I have learned about pricing for me that other people have told me have been helpful for them as well is, first of all, if I'm selling something, offering something for money, and I feel resentful at 
towards the person who's buying it, I am charging too little. Mm -hmm. If I'm like, you know, I don't want to do this piece or I don't want to sell this piece, I know that I'm charging too little. I need to raise my price. And at the same time, if I don't have just a little bit of mild discomfort about feeling like, oh my goodness, is this price too high, then I'm probably charging too low. Now that is not going to be true across the board probably, but for people who have a tendency to undercharge, you want to err on the side of charging a little bit more than you feel comfortable with. And as you feel comfortable with charging that, then you can charge a little bit more and a little bit more. Pricing is, is, is um, subject, it's, it depends on so many different factors. So you want to think about where you are in your art career, whether you're you know, a beginning emerging artist with your career or you know, much further along, that's going to affect the price. Um, what other people who are selling similar kinds of work what they're charging, your location in the world. If you mm -hmm. are it, in the internet, if you're only selling online, then this is not so much of an issue. But if you're selling locally, if you're you know at an art fair and the person next to you is selling things for five hundred dollars and you're selling equivalent kinds of things for hundred dollars, then and yeah, you, know, you, you you should probably be thinking about that, right? Yeah. yeah. So th those are some of my pricing tips. What about you, Corey? Yeah, I think you know, Melissa, I've heard you answer that question so many times in so many different ways, <laughs> and um, I think you've you've got a, a really good solution dialed in. You know, I think that works really well for artists is having that sort of intuitive pricing. Um, until you get to sort of selling art at, at in very high end galleries, and then it becomes a little bit of a a little more of a strategy that where you work with your gallery owner and your and your uh, agent. Uh, but that that sort of intuitive pricing uh, is a, is a really great way of handling it for artists and a great way of understanding it uh, for somebody who doesn't have a lot of business training. Uh, the other thing to think about is um, consistency. So you want to make your pricing easy to understand, easy for buyers to understand. And mm -hmm. if you are working, if you're working, say, as a painter, and you work in uh, on canvas, or you know, then pricing according to size is something that people can understand. You as an artist might put in, you know, 200 hours on this 12 by 12 piece and 20 hours or 2 hours on this other 12 by 12 piece. So to you, this 12 by 12 piece is just like, "Oh my god, you poured your oh, 200 hours." But a, a customer coming along, an art buyer coming along is not going to see that. They're just going to see two 12 by 12 pieces. So mm -hmm. to them, you know, why is this one more expensive than this one? Don't price it according to, um, you know, don't price your babies <laughs> according to how much you love them. Price them according to something that people can understand, like size. Yeah. Uh, and I know a lot of artists use a square inch method, which is one way of going about it. I'm currently pricing by linear inch, which is height plus width rather than height times width, because um, if I'm selling a 4x4 four four and an 18x18, 18 18, the difference in price makes kind of sense. Whereas if I'm if it, the square, if I'm pricing by the square inch, uh, a 4x4 four four is going to be so cheap in comparison to the 18x18, 18 18, which is going to be so expensive that it doesn't seem to jive. It just seems kind of confusing to buyers. So if you have a big, wide uh, range of sizes that you sell, you might consider using the linear inch method. Yeah. Holy cow, we're getting into some really, like, specific... This is how... <laughs> <laughs> I love that you just spent like five minutes explaining linear inch versus square inch pricing. <laughs> um, I, I I love doing this. It's seriously fun. Um, I'm having a good time. Yes, it is seriously fun, and we are close to the end of our hour. It's mm -hmm. gone by very very quickly. Um, I think we should probably wrap up, Corinne. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, but I wanted to remind everybody that uh, tomorrow we are going to be doing website reviews and flash coaching sessions. So in order to be considered for one of those spots, they're going to be limited because we're only going to have about an hour. Um, first of all, you have to be signed up on our mailing list, uh, artempowers.me, and we will send you a link to the application. And Corey and I are going to look through the applications and we'll select a few people to critique their websites live and to have um, flash coaching with. Uh, at our last uh, Game Changer call tomorrow, 
same time, same channel, uh, tomorrow, February 26th, Wednesday. So go sign up at artempowers.me if you're not already on the list, and that will get you access to the application form to get either flash coaching or have your site reviewed. Uh, and we will see you all here tomorrow, Wednesday, February 26th, 3 p.m. Pacific time. See Thank you, Corey. Everybody. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye. Bye.